the initial findings in the brain, and I won't spend a lot of time with them because this audience is probably most of you are not trained in, in this kind of stuff, but I need to tell you something about it because that's what I've done. <laughs> uh, so what were the findings in the dyslexic brains? There were these little clouds of brain cells that I'm pointing to here with the red arrows, which were present in a layer of the cerebral cortex, which is the very outside part of the, of the, of the brain, where they shouldn't be, indicating that they had migrated to the wrong place. Why migrate it? Because neurons, which are the brain cells we care about here, are born here at the depth of the brain near the ventricle, which is a fluid-filled structure here, and then they migrate to the cortex following certain rules. And there are at least 15 to 20 genes now that have been identified that have a role to play in this migration. The right kind of neurons have to migrate to the right part of the brain in order for them to establish connectivity and the right kind of circuitry that will do the job you want them to do. Now, it turns out that most of these little errors of migration occurred in this part of the brain, which we call the perisylvian cortex, which contains a lot of the classical language areas. We know that they're classical language areas because classically, when uh, adults had injury in these parts of the brain, they developed language problems. The injuries were most likely strokes, but they could be blunt injury or all kinds of injury. The other finding in a dyslexic brain was that the language areas tended to be more symmetrical than usual. And this is a language area here called the planum temporale. And the typical finding was that they were quite symmetrical in size when, as you'll see later, these areas tend to be quite asymmetrical in size in the majority of the population. So that was a variant. You know, if you looked at 10 consecutive brains of dyslexics, they all had some aberrancy in the degree of asymmetry of this area compared to uh, the population at large. So there are two very distinct findings, one having to do with asymmetry or brain lateralization, which includes brain lateralization for language, and the other one had to do with the development of the cerebral cortex, particularly affecting language area. We didn't know the impact of this. This is just... Uh, a relatively small number of brains examined after death at autopsy. Maybe they're the tip of the iceberg. Maybe they're markers for something else more important. Uh, we can't know about cause. It's tantalizing to think that these are causally related because they're affecting language areas. But you know, some of them are very small and when you injure the brain with tiny lesions like that in an adult, you don't get any clinical findings. So you had to sort of do some mental gymnastics to, to make a claim that these kinds of things could affect the developing brain so much that they would have difficulty with reading. And we knew that that was the challenge back at the beginning, and we never claimed at the beginning that this was causal, but there was an interesting observation that needed additional work. So here's, this is uh, summarized here. We have disturbances in neuronal migration and we have disturbances in the manifestation of cerebral asymmetry affecting language areas. And then, you know, the field of brain sciences, particularly brain sciences, uh, interested in behavior. There are lots of brain sciences interested in muscle function and all kinds of other things. There were two major advances that helped us move this research along. There was the birth of uh, cognitive neuroscience. And the cognitive neuroscience uh, was born as a result of our improving ability to examine the living human brain acting and doing things. So you can sort of make a human being carry out a particular task, could it be in language or in attention or in memory, or some sort of visual processing. And you could see that using these special tools that certain parts of the brain activated when, you, when they were uh, performing these tasks. So this ability to visualize activation in parts of the brain 
gave us uh, a way to study how the brain is organized for particular functions. We had some idea about these before through studying strokes, for instance. If you injure certain parts of the brain, you lost certain functions. But this was better because it's a long story, but it's circuitous to know that if you lose something, that's equivalent to that part of the brain doing it. You know. So, for instance, if you have a radio and you cut the wire, you lose the function of the radio, but that wire isn't doing it. It's happening in the radio. You know what I mean? This is kind of circuitous uh, thinking that made the analysis of strokes limited, but this provided new ways to find out what parts of the brain were doing things for particular tasks and how different parts of the brain interacted during these tasks. And the other advancement was the birth of molecular genetics and cell biology, where again, because of it, just like war, science is just like war. In war, the one who invents the new weapon is the one who wins. You know, remember the Hundred Year War between France and England? You know, they had these Welsh arch archers with these long arches, uh, with bows and arrows that reached much farther and they could stand far away and get all, all the French guys. And none of the French guys could get them. Same with uh, science. You know, the, the discovery of new tools allow us to look at uh, cell function. We can understand how genes are organized. We could understand how genes act in molecular pathway to change the function of a particular cell. If it, that cell was a neuron, it also changed the way by which this neuron related to other neurons in circuitry. So you can begin to study from the bottom up how circuits and networks work to support different kinds of behavior. And so we piggybacked on that too.